Hello, welcome to Pocus Geek. I'm Jared Marks, and I'm going to walk you through a case where a patient fell off a ladder and presented to the emergency department. His blood pressures were borderline low, and he was having some respiratory difficulty. The fall was about 8 to 10 feet. And we're going to go through the EFAST exam and how that's incorporated into the care of this patient and the subtle findings and pitfalls we see within this exam. So we'll start with an EFAST in the right upper quadrant and we're going to look and identify the diaphragm and then look above that diaphragm, especially in somebody with respiratory distress for free fluid. So if we look at where this red arrow is, we do not see the spine continue above the diaphragm and we do not see any free fluid. So in this case, so far, no free fluid above the uh, diaphragm. Then we're going to appreciate the hepatorenal space is depicted by the red line and we're going to look for anechoic stripe through there indicating free fluid. After evaluating this area, we're going to go down to the inferior tip of the liver, known as the pericolic gutter. And this is the most sensitive spot for free fluid in the abdomen in a supine patient. And fortunately for this patient, it's negative in this case. Then we're going to go on to a subxiphoid view in somebody in respiratory distress with borderline blood pressures and evaluate the uh, heart. And what we see here is that this is the heart here with the liver sitting just above that. And then we're going to see that those two on the video are uh, right up next to each other. There's no space in between them. It's hard to, so there's no pericardial effusion. It's hard in this case to determine the function of the heart given the limitations of the curvilinear probe. And if you wanted, you could change to the phased array or cardiac probe. But in this case, uh, it does look generally okay and, and appears to probably have good function. So we're going to move on. As we continue the EFAST, we're going to evaluate the left upper quadrant. First, we're going to focus on identifying the diaphragm and then looking for free fluid in the left hemithorax, where the red arrow indicates. In this case, we see more artifact than we do pathological finding. If there was pathology, we would expect the spine to continue above the diaphragm, which we do not see here. We would continue by evaluating the intraabdominal cavity or intraperitoneal area for free fluid. Here we're going to look at the superior medial aspect of the spleen. And we don't see free fluid here, but then we can look along the supraspleenic area, subdiaphragmatic for free fluid. Now in this case, we do not see a positive finding. However, we do have this area that again is artifact more than it is free fluid. And how we tell that is we see that the diaphragm does not continue through that area. Otherwise, we'd be able to see a separation of the spleen from the diaphragm, and that would indicate to us that it's a positive uh, fast exam for intraperitoneal fluid. In this case, we do not see that, so this is negative for free fluid. Now, although the spleno-renal recess, or this area between the spleen and kidney, is not very sensitive for free fluid, we'd still evaluate here for free fluid. As we continue further evaluation of the left upper quadrant, we're going to look at the left pericolic gutter or the inferior pole of the spleen. In this case, we do not see anything at the inferior pole of the spleen, so negative for free fluid in this area. As we move on to the pelvis, we're going to look at the long axis of the pelvis, and we want to identify our bladder and then the superior wall, which we see here in red. Along that superior portion where the arrow indicates, we're going to look for free fluid. We're going to continue looking along that superior portion to evaluate for any anechoic structures. This is the key in the pelvis or in the suprapubic area to evaluate for free fluid in the lower intraperitoneal cavity. In this case, we do not see any free fluid. In a short access, in this case, they looked down towards the prostate and this actually gets below um, the intraperitoneal cavity and into the pelvis and is not the ideal view. You typically want to be above or superior to the prostate. This is a good landmark to start with, but you want to fan up to evaluate into the abdomen. As we continue this evaluation, we're going to look at the patient's right chest to evaluate for a pneumothorax since this patient has difficulty breathing. What we can see here is the pleural line, a rib, and then the next pleural space. And as we look for that bright white line to slide back and forth, that indicates to us that there is no pneumothorax because this is normal lung sliding here. Now when we look at the left, we're going to again identify the rib, the pleural line, here we see the subclavian artery and then the subclavian vein. And again, we're going to focus on the pleural line, which we are going to see here in the video. Now, this looks a little bit different than the last 
uh, lung sliding that we see. We can see an area that continues to be bright and then it gets dark and there's not sliding along that entire space. We can focus in on that area and what we see is that this area has lung sliding and this area does not and it's in the same uh, intercostal space. This is what's known as a lung point and a lung point means that there is a pneumothorax present. So in this patient that had a fall, it's likely that they have uh, rib fractures associated with this pneumothorax. And although this looks small at this time, this gives you a chance to either evaluate or proceed with tube thoracostomy if needed in this patient. I hope you found that useful as far as being able to identify a pneumothorax in a trauma patient, even in this subtle finding in this patient. If you have any questions about this or other videos, please feel free to comment below or email me at pokusgeek at gmail.com.